Hello humans, welcome back to the Let's Learn Python tutorial series. We are in unit two, topic number three. It's gonna get exciting, 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 because we're gonna start looping. It's gonna be good. First, we gotta go back and look at the challenge from the last lesson, so let's do that right now. All right, here we are. Last lesson's challenge was a little bit of math. We were doing a quadratic root solve. So taking a quadratic equation in general form, taking the ABC values, determining whether there is two real roots, one real root, which is technically just two real roots that are the same, or no real roots. And then if there were real roots to show the value. So here we go. Import math, we're gonna need that because we're gonna do the square root function. ABC are floats given to us by the user. I'm gonna calculate the discriminant myself. I did this as a, a quick little variable, and it's just B squared minus four times a times c. And this just made my math a little bit easier later on because I had already calculated the discriminant. And then I did if statement. If the discriminant is greater than zero, which means there is more than one real root, and then we'll do two calculations. I did a root one variable and a root two variable. Root one was negative b plus the square root of the discriminant and then all divided by two a. Root two was negative one times b minus the square root of the discriminant and then all divided by two times a. And then I printed root one and then the root one value, printed root two and then the root two value. Else if the discriminant is zero, which means you have one real root, then I just did the same exact code here. I just only did it once. I just did the root one instead of doing it twice with the plus or the minus. Because it doesn't actually matter if I do a plus or a minus here, the values will be the same because that's how it works. And then if it's an else, so if I reach this point, it means the discriminant was negative, which means there are no real roots. So all I do is print out, no real roots. So there's your code, pause the video. If you need to take a closer look at it, hit me up in the comments if you have questions. We're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about loops. So this video specifically, we're gonna talk about something called a for loop. We'll deal with while loops later on. For loops are great for when we have some type of fixed iteration, so we know how many times we wanna loop. So let's just do a simple count by 10 to kind of learn the syntax. For, lowercase, reserved, words, i. Now i is a variable. It does not have to be i. It can be any variable name. Okay, following variable name standards. No spaces or nonsense like that. In, which is also a reserved word. Notice how it turned yellow. Range. Range is a function in Python. Now range allows us to give it one, two, or three parameters. So we can either just give it one number, two numbers, or three numbers, and they're going to have different impacts. We'll do all three in this video. We're going to start with one number. I'm going to put a five in there and then a colon at the end, okay? So for i in range five, colon, enter, tab. So now I'm in the code. So what I'm saying is what I put here is gonna run each time the loop uh, executes, okay? So let's just put a print i in here so we can see the execution. Okay, I'm gonna run it just like this so we can kind of get a taste for what's going on. So when I run it, I see zero, one, two, three, four. That's what gets printed to the screen. So let's go back and analyze what's going on there. So what's happening is it's setting a variable called i. Python is defaulting that variable's initial value to zero, and it's going up until that variable reaches five, but not including when it's equal to five. So when i is zero, it prints zero. Then without us seeing it or writing anything, it automatically iterates i to one. And it checks, is one less than five? Yes, it is, print one. Iterate to two, is two less than five? Yes, it is, print two, iterate to three. Is three less than five? Yes, print three, iterate. I is now four. Is four less than five? Yes, it is, print four, iterate to five. Is five less than five? No, it is not. Five is equal to five. Therefore, does not run the print statement when I is equal to five which is why when we run it, we see zero, one, two, three, four, which is five executions, but not the actual values, one, two, three, four, five, okay? So that is the kind of basics of that temporary variable that we're using inside of our loop to iterate in value to allow us to control the number of executions that happen. So let's say we wanna clean this up a little bit. Let's say we wanna do an I in range 10, which should print the numbers zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine but I wanna have a comma and a space after each one. So end equals comma, or quote, comma, space, quote, just so that the values will all be on the same line with a comma at the end of them. So let's run that and just kinda of get a taste of what's happening. 
Okay, so I get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I get this ugly comma at the end. I don't like that. I feel like we can get rid of that. We can do better. In order to get rid of that, I need the last execution to actually just do a regular print statement and not do one of the ones with the special end behavior. So we need an if statement. If i is less than 9, so if i is less than 9, then do this print. I tab it in. Else, just do a regular print of i, which will jump to the next line after it's done printing. So this should only have the value of 9 get printed the way we want. Let's run it. So we run it. Ta-da! There's no comma on the end. Awesome. So our if statements from before are coming back to help us in our loops. This is great. I'm going to comment this out, and we're going to move on, and we're going to look at the two-parameter version of the for loop. So the two-parameter version of for looping has a start value and then an end value. Now, the same way as the end value before was not included, that's still the case here. But now instead of i defaulting to zero or whatever our iterating variable name is, starting at zero, we can define its start value as one or some other number. So let's say I wanted to print the numbers five, six, seven, eight, nine. I would start at five and I would end at 10. Okay, now I've got similar behavior here. I'm gonna bring back that nice clean if structure that we had before. Actually, you know what? Let's make this even better. Let's do a min variable and a max variable and then let's put those in our range function, okay? And then we'll do our nice clean if statements. So if i is less than our max minus one, so in other words, everything but the last number, then we'll do this pretty print statement here with the uh, special end behavior and the commas. Else, we'll just do a regular print i, regular boring print statement. Notice my tabs are becoming nested. Like this is two tabs in, separate block of code from the for loop. Starting to see those blocks of code becomes important. Ditch this one here at the end, we don't need that. So the nice thing here is now I can just change these values or I could ask the user for these values, right? So let's run this, make sure it prints what we want. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and no comma on the end. And we could take that a step further and these could become say int input and then just min and this could be int input max. And we run it again. And now it asks us for the min. So I want from one to six. So I'm gonna do one to seven. And I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Cool, and that's working well. So that's a two parameter, it gives us both ends of the spectrum in terms of the loop. So the next one is the three parameter. Three parameter allows us to control the iteration. So to do this example, I'm going to do what's called a factorial calculator. So for those of you who don't know what a factorial is, the notation is an exclamation point. It's a mathematical thing. n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. So for example, 5 factorial would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and it would equal 120. So the negative one is going to tell us that we're going down by one after each iteration instead of going up by one, which is great for our factorial because we want to start at the top and work our way down. The thing to be careful with with factorials is you don't ever want to multiply by zero because then the whole thing is just going to become zero. If you kind of test this out just to see now, I, I know I've got some code in here for actually doing the calculation, but let's ditch that for right now and let's just put a print i so we can kind of see the print. Comment that out too. Run this. Okay, and I'll give it a five. So we see five, four, three, two. Now, I didn't include the one. Now I could include the one, but multiplying by one doesn't actually change the value. If I set this to zero as the middle parameter and I save and I run, now you'll see that one is in there as well. If that makes you feel better, we can keep it in there. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect the multiplication. So how did I do the actual calculation? Well, again, we're starting to see worlds collide here, or at least I hope we are. So I'm creating a variable. I called it n fact, and I set it equal to one. And that variable is something that I can multiply or add to as I go. So inside of my for loop, I'm not printing anything. I'm taking my n factorial, which is my variable that I've created, it's currently equal to one, and I'm making it equal to itself multiplied by the value of i. So if we take our five example, n is five, n factorial is one. 
for i in range starting at 5. So now i is 5, and I'm doing n factorial equals 1 times 5. So now n factorial is equal to 5. So I come back in the loop, i is now 4 because it's decremented by 1. So i is now 4, which is greater than 0, so we're good to run. So now n factorial is equal to 5, which is its current value, times 4. So it's now equal to 20. Okay, i is now equal to 3 because it decremented, which is greater than 0, so that's good. So now n factorial is 20 multiplied by 3, so it's now 60. i is now 2, which is bigger than 0, so now this is 60 times 2, which is 120. Awesome. This goes down to 1. 1 is still greater than 0, so it runs. This is now 120 times 1, which is equal to 120. If I run the code, we'll see n factorial equals 120. All right, so that's a more complicated loop where we're kind of using the three parameters in range to start somewhere, end somewhere, and also to decrement as we're going instead of incrementing up. Now you could change that to an increment by like a multiplier or an increment by an addition or whatever you want to do. Uh, you can do some pretty cool stuff with for loops when you know what you want to do. All right, next up we're going to look at looping through a string. This is a pretty quick one. So looping through a string is great, and we'll do more on strings later on in the course, but if I have a variable and it's a string equal to Batman, I can do this lovely thing using the in keyword just like in range, so for C in word. Now because word is a string, this variable, this temporary variable, which I'm calling C, references individual letters in the word. So I can do for C in word, print the letter and then a space. So this should take the string Batman and essentially print it one character, then a space, one character, then a space. And I put this blank print here just to jump to the next line if you were doing multiple things in your program. So save that and run it. You see there's Batman, but with spaces in between the letters. You could also have done something like just print C, where to print them vertically. Right, so there's Batman, the characters of the string. So you can also use a for loop to loop through uh, a word or a string. We can also use it for lists, which we'll do later when we do data structures. For loops become really, really important when we're doing that. You can also nest loops. So you can have a for loop inside of a for loop. And then you get this nested execution, which you can make some really cool stuff with that, and you probably will. But we're not going to jump into it right now. We'll, we'll focus on uh, initial loops. We can bring in some crazy nested stuff later on. Hopefully that makes some sense. I'm going to throw a link to the W3 schools uh, on for loops into the description because I think it's helpful. But let's talk about the challenge. All right, we're gonna talk about the challenge for unit two, topic number three. The challenge for this one is gonna be doing a program that will print out uh, an arithmetic or a geometric sequence. So what that is, for those of you who don't know, is it is a series of numbers that add or subtract by the same value each time. So let's just set it up here. So A represents the starting value, so let's just pick five. D represents how much I go up or down by between terms. So let's say three and n is how many terms, so let's say 10. So you'll see here's my list of numbers. It starts at five, goes up by three each time. So five, eight, 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, 26, 29, 32. There's 10 numbers, right? Starting at five, going up by three each time. This is called an arithmetic sequence. And then I added in the sum, so the total of adding all of those up. So this was my arithmetic one. Let's have a quick look at the geometric. So this is the geometric version of this. So when I run this, I get an A, which is my initial, then I get an R, and R is how much I times by between each value, let's say two, and then how many terms do I want to see, let's say six. So five, 10, 20, 40, 80, 160. They're doubling each time, multiplying by two, and then I see a sum, so the total of all those terms. I could also run this, say, with a big number and a 0 0.5 for the multiplier, and then I see 100, 50, 25, 12.5, 6.25, and a sum. So these are using uh, for loops to do this. Now you can write them as two separate programs like I did. So you got your arithmetic and then you got your geometric. You can just write one if you wanna write just one. Uh, but they should take those values, the initial value, the shift value, so the difference or the ratio, and then how many terms. And then that focuses on how the loop is actually gonna run. And then this sum variable that you're gonna keep track of uh, as you're going through. Very similar to that factorial variable that we use when we were doing the factorial example. So this is loops. 
This is a lot of information to cram in a short amount of time. You're gonna need to practice this. I'm also gonna put a link in the description to Coding Bat, which is a great practice website for like tricky problems, but they've got a great section on loops in Python that if you really wanna challenge your understanding, it's a good spot to go. Good luck on the challenge. Thanks for sticking with it. Things are starting to get a bit tricky now. You're gonna to start to hit a wall. You're gonna to start to struggle. That's normal. Uh, keep at it, keep coding, keep making mistakes and learning from them. And then come back, hit the comments if you have questions. We'll see you back in video two. And we'll see you back in the next video. Like it, share, subscribe, do all those things. I love it. And we'll see you soon. Bye humans.